Hello. So today we are going to take a look at doing a complete flight in the fly-by-wire A320 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. This is something several people have asked me to do. Typically in the past I've just bookended kind of the recordings at just doing a cold and dark startup or maybe an ILS demonstration and I very rarely have done a full flight. But of course unbeknown to um, anybody watching the channel I regularly take part in group flights where we operate the aircraft from end to end so I thought it might be worth just doing a an example flight with the fly-by-wire A320. It's worth pointing out actually I don't tend to fly it very often so I've chosen it today purely because I know lots of people use it. Normally I would be flying the, either the Boeing or the Phoenix or something like that. So I'm, I'm going to be using my own checklist from the past to help me along the way. Mistakes will be made but hopefully you'll see if I do make any mistakes the instructive thing will be kind of getting back out of them because that's half of it. I know a lot of people learn things by rote and don't really learn how things work so then diagnosing problems becomes a nightmare if you don't kind of figure out why you're doing things. So I'll be explaining along the way and we'll see how we get on. So we are today going to, let me just switch this off, we're going to fly from Dortmund in Germany over to Frankfurt. It's quite a short flight so it was intentionally chosen so it will keep us busy all or most of the way. Of course this is an Airbus so most of the work will be done on the ground before we take off. Um, it's worth pointing out actually in the real world if you go and look at some videos of real flight deck footage on YouTube you will find the pilots actually manually flying the aircraft a lot more than the simulation community tend to. So, but the thing is there are two of them on the flight deck so where the co-pilot might actually manually fly the aircraft for large sections of the departure or the approach in the simulator you tend to find people getting the autopilot to do that for them while they are doing other things and that's I think that's typically just a workload issue but it's an easy trap to fall into to think in the real world that the autopilot is used more than it actually is so you know there's various jokes that the pilots will say that you know commercial air traffic pilots themselves will say they are by nature lazy and they'll use the systems to their benefit but also they have to practice their skills because they know as well that the least you know the less they practice the more rusty they will get with actual stick rudder skills so um, it's just to keep that in mind there's only one of me in the cockpit I'm going to be talking like I said I'll probably make some mistakes along the way so bear with me you'll also notice I'm using the checklist this is going to be very very functional in terms of the things I do in the cockpit so in the real aircraft there's a host of checks and balances you do to make sure systems are operating correctly I am going to presume everything is going to work I'm not going to do all the fire checks or the system checks I'm just gonna go with it and see how we get on okay so first things first we go overhead in the Airbus and we turn on the batteries so we press both battery buttons and the systems come online. If we have external power available we can use it. So external power comes up then we immediately go to the external light section at the bottom left and we turn the strobes to auto and the nav and logos to number two. There isn't an option for number one on the fly-by-wire Airbus so don't worry about that. Then on the APU section we immediately go and turn the master switch for the APU, the auxiliary power unit, to on and then start it. So that's the small jet engine in the tail that provides electrical power and compressed air to spin up the engines. If we go and spin around the view to look at the tail you can see the heat is pouring out already as the APU comes up. Within the cockpit as soon as we switched on the APU the lower engineering screen would have come up and you can see the, um, the speed of the jet engine coming up of the the APU you can see the exhaust gas temperature and you'll see when it starts generating electric as well so if you are not looking at that screen you can change to this is called the ecam display you can change the display that is shown by using these buttons down here so there's two places you can get to the APU to see its status you can either go to the electric page and it appears there in the little box so it's just it's just started look so 0% on the power generation so far 
or on the actual APU page where it gives you more details. And there you go, it's doing it. Okay, and flap open. Okay, so the APU is up and running anyway. So back overhead, we need to go and turn on the crew oxygen supply. Then we turn the emergency exit light to armed, which is here. And we set no smoking to auto. Then right up at the top, we go and switch on the inertial guidance system. So there are some realism options for this in the tablet at the side of the aircraft with how fast this happens. I think I've set it to instant. Whereas in the real world, it can be seven or eight minutes. So the inertial guidance system uses gyros. So this is how the aircraft knows which way up it is and which, you know, if it's accelerating in a given direction. It uses gyros to do that. Um, and they take a few minutes to calibrate and stabilize. Okay, so if we go to the cockpit view, we're going to go and brighten up the various screens around the aircraft. So for these two screens, it's the two knobs here. So the big knob does the, the left one, and the little knob in the, in the middle of the right-hand one is the um, navigation display. And it's the opposite on the co-pilot's side. So we can turn the, the inner one and the outer one that brightens those screens up for us. In terms of the engineering displays, the two knobs for those are down here, the ECAM screens. So we'll just turn them around to halfway to brighten them up a little bit. And for the MCDUs, the, the flight management computers, we can use the, the rocker knob at the, or rocker switch at the side to brighten them up. OK, so that's that done. So we're going to go and program the flight computer. So we're going to go to the FMGC. And there's a message at the bottom. The bottom line is used both as what's called the scratch pad for keying things in and as a message display. So it says we're using the, the primary GPS system. So we can clear that message. And the first thing we're going to do is go to the init page, which is where we set up the, where we're going from and to, basically. So we're going from EDLW, which is Dortmund, to EDDF, which is Frankfurt. So EDLW to EDDF. So E. D L W, you can see down here, slash E D D F. So the important thing here is we are copying the format of the field that we want to fill in. Then we click, click the soft key next to it to transfer what we've keyed into the scratch pad into the field. It comes up with this confirmation page and we just come back. So it's done. We can set a cost index. The cost index relates to a formula that governs how aggressively the aircraft can climb or accelerate. It can be several hundred. Normally it's on your operational flight plan. So if you've used Simbrief and you've got your operational flight plan for the aircraft type, it's probably got a cost index on it. So you should be able to find that and then key it in. We're just going to put 100 in. Cruise flight level, we're going to go to 25,000 feet. So flight levels are altitude in feet divided by 100. So 250 is 25,000 feet. You can type in 25,000 and put it in there and it will understand that. Okay, there is another page to the init. If you go left or right, it will get to it. So we can set our zero fuel weight of the airframe. If you just click on it, it will already know it. And then you can drop it in. And the block fuel, so how much fuel have we got right now? So we're, we've got enough in the, in the aircraft to not have to worry about this. So by default, the flight simulator starts up, I think, with the aircraft 50% full. So we're going to put in the amount in tonnes, so 3.8 tonnes. So 3.8 goes into the block fuel. OK, so we've done that bit. After we have completed that, we can go to the flight plan page to program the flight itself. So clicked on flight plan and all it's got at the moment is where we're going from and to, which is what we put into the initialization page. If we click on the airport that we're leaving from, it gives us the option to set the departure, which we will do. We are going to be, let's go and have a look at the chart. We're going to be taking off runway 06 and using the BAM S2Q departure. 
and the Bamsu transition. So there's runway 06. We're now looking for the SID or standard instrument departure. There's BAM S2Q. And I don't think this has the transitions by the look of it. So we'll just insert that. Okay, so it's put the various waypoints along the standard instrument departure into, and it's ended at BAMSU. There was obviously only one option. So um, it's put those in, and then it's got a discontinuity, and then it's got the destination. So in other words, it's not going to try and figure out how we get from the end of the standard instrument departure all the way to the destination. So in other words, it's got us to there, it's not going to figure the rest down. So we're going to now going to tell it about the destination. So we're going to runway 7 right using the UNOC 3H arrival. Okay, so if we go and click on EDDF, which always appears at the bottom of the flight plan page, the destination will always appear bottom left. So go to the arrival information, 7 left we want, and we want the ILS, so 7 left ILS Zulu will be fine. Was it 7 left or 7 right? No, it was 7 right. So we can erase what we've just done. Let's do that again. EDDF, arrival, we want 7 right, so it's not on here. So we push up, ILS 7 right, there it is. And we wanted the UNOC. 3H. So we'll push through the stars by scrolling the screen. UNOC 3H, there it is. Now, do we have a specific transition? It's just a, it says the UNOCO transition. So do we have a UNOCO transition on here? No, we don't. So we're not going to worry about that. I think it's going to say RID to be honest that's where that ends here so yes we say rid and insert that so then if we go and scroll through just to see there's the end of the standard instrument departure there's the beginning of the standard approach route so that it hasn't got a discontinuity there which is interesting if we carry on down it's gone all the way to the approach so it seems to be quite happy with doing the entire route all on its own which is good i was expecting a discontinuity but we haven't got one okay so now we've done that we need to go to the performance page and in order to get the v speeds calculated the rotate speeds of the aircraft on the runway we need to tell it what flap setting we're going to be using we're going to use flap setting one so i'll just put one in and key it into the flaps and then when I key on these, I will get these, the system will automatically calculate the rotate speeds. Okay, we're not going to worry about flex temperatures or anything like that. So we can look at the next phase, next phase, next phase. So this is the descent rate, and then we've got the approach into the destination. So if we wanted to, we could go and get the QNH. So let's just do that for a bit of fun to see how you might get some weather data. So in the um, MCDU, if you go to the MCDU menu, go to ATSU and AOC, and then do a weather request, a WX request. And it's notice it already has the destination and departure airfields programmed in because they're in the flight plan. So we can send that weather request and it will go and get the data for the weather for those airports for us. So then if we come back a page, we can look in received messages. Now, I'm not sure this always works, but it should come up saying there's a company message on the, the display here, but it doesn't always work, I don't think. So if we go and have a look in received messages, yeah, we can see we've got the meta information. Is it saying it there? No, it isn't. So there's the weather information. So you can see at Frankfurt, we've got a QNH of 1028. So to make this easier to reference, we can print it. And there's a little thermal printer in the corner of the centre pedestal. And that will print out those weather readings for us. So when it's finished printing, we can just click on the printout and the simulator will very nicely go and put that printout on the middle section. So that 1028, if we remember, we go and look at performance again and go to, let's just center this up, 
next phase, next phase, next phase, next phase. So we're looking at the approach data. So we can put in 1028. Obviously we're doing this ahead of time. In the real world, this would be done while you're en route. And the temperature at the destination, that's not actually appearing on here. So no need to worry about that. Um, do we get the temperature here? Let's just put in, yeah, it's zero, it's cold. Um, I think that's good to go. So then we go next phase. And obviously we're not going to bother with go around because we're going to land first time. <laughs> first time every time, as Batman would say. Um, and you can see we've got the, the route has appeared solid in the EFIS display. So if you do want to check your route, all you have to do is go to the flight plan page and then check, change the mode on here to plan mode. And as you scroll up and down through the legs, it will move you around the route to see where you're going. Yeah, each one, you, you will notice the second line down is the one that is centered on the display. So as you move your way through the route, you can see the legs of the flight plan. And obviously you can zoom in and out as well to get a wider view of what you're doing. Yeah, so we've got this nice view of us coming in and doubling back on ourselves and going in for approach. Okay, so we'll go back to arc mode on the view so it gives us the aircraft relative view and we'll pull the zoom back to 10 miles. So where are we on our printed checklist? I will try to remember to put a link to the printed checklist I'm using in the notes of the video. Uh, we've done the programming of flight, so we have set the flaps, we've set the rotate speeds, so now we go and press Control 2. Um, notice you've got the barometric pressure reading, it will be wrong at the moment. We're going to press B, which will calibrate it, so you can see the altitude change to, to give us the accurate altitude above sea level of our current situation. Um, we can also go and pre-configure some of the, the data around the cockpit. So we are going to climb out to 5,000 feet. The reason for that is on the approach chart. Oh, sorry, the, des the <laughs> standard instrument departure chart. So this is the chart we're using. We're taking off and we're going to follow this route. To actually see that, to make some sense, if I overlay it onto the flight plan, you can see the route drawn in. Now notice there are no blue restrictions on this chart, on this side of it. There's one on the other side but there's none on this side, but there is an initial climb clearance of 5,000 feet. And the reason for that is that is the transition altitude. So when we get to 5,000 feet, we switch the barometric pressure to normal or standard, sorry. Okay. So we don't need to worry about too much in the Airbus. We've got a fully programmed flight plan, so we can use managed speed mode, managed uh, heading mode, managed altitude to get to that altitude. Um, we may use vertical speed on the descent just to give ourselves something to do. Okay, so where are we? So we need to go up back overhead now, go and turn the seatbelt sign to on. Turn the external power to off because the APU is now up and running. And we perform pushback. So it's quite interesting in the Airbus that you can perform pushback. Actually, before we do that, just before we do that, we're going to do this a little bit out of step with the, the checklist I've got. We're going to go and switch on the fuel pumps. Yeah. And then we can perform pushback. We're just doing that to save ourselves from having an extra thing to do in a moment. So on the third item down on the, the tablet, there's a pushback section. If we enable the pushback system and confirm it, we can call the tug. So you can see that the tug is maneuvering around the front of the aircraft. We'll come off the parking brake. So you can see the parking brake is now off. It says tug is attached, so we can start pushing the aircraft backwards and we can manipulate how fast it moves and we can change the tug, tug direction so we can actually 
make the pushback happen to, to roughly where we want it to be. The interesting thing in the real world is usually during pushback the crew would be starting the engines as, cr as pushback happens. Um, with only one of me to talk and show you this and start the engines that's going to be actually quite difficult to do everything all at once so I'm just going to wait for pushback and then we will tell pushback to stop and then I'll start the engines but obviously that's in the real world you've got two people up here doing this so we can stop the the pushback turn the system off confirm it put the parking brake back on for the moment and we wait for him to get out of the way. Now, while pushback was happening in the real world, what would what we would have really done is put the beacon light on. Flight attendants, arm doors, and cross check. And I'm just checking the list to make sure I've not I've not missed anything enormous. So the fuel pumps were already on. We go and turn the APU bleed on at last. So that provides the compressed air from the auxiliary power unit to the engines and we can start the engines. So we turn the ignition to the start setting. We flick the starter for engine number two and you will see the, the gas turbine for Four engine number two is coming up. Okay, so it should climb straight through 20% because we have the fuel pumps on. So exhaust gas temperature is raising and then thrust is coming out the back of the engine which is therefore going to spin up the turbofan, so the percentage of turbofan speed is increasing now as well. Crossfeed to provide power from the engines rather than the APU happens fully automatically in the Airbus. So we'll wait for the engine to stabilise. I believe, actually, we can start both engines at the same time. Yeah, we can. Okay, so as soon as both engines are ignited and started, we can turn the ignition back to norm. There we go, exhaust gas temperature is coming up on engine number one, the left engine. You can see that happening outside. So engine number two is spinning already. Engine number one is coming up to speed. So just waiting for that to complete. There we go. So you heard a clunk there, that would have been the cross feed. So we can go and turn off the ignition system, turn it back to norm. Okay. Okay, so ignition to norm. APU bleed can now be switched off. The compressed air and the electricity generation from the APU are no longer needed. So APU comes off, APU comes off, and the aircraft is pretty much ready to go. So during the taxi, I've noticed there's something missing on the checklist, actually. There's a tiny little switch down here, which is called predictive wind shear, which is the um, for the aircraft to, pr to predict wind shear, strangely enough. You also get notices here that are your final check of things to do. So it's telling us that TCAS is still on standby. So we'll go and enable TCAS before we get to the runway. Normally you'd do this on the runway, but we're going to set it to TA, not TARA. Um, it's still saying APU is available, which is quite interesting, anyway. Uh, parking brake is on, seat belts are on, no smoking sign is on. We are pretty much ready to go, ladies and gentlemen. So we're going to taxi over to the runway. You can see if we zoom in and keep zooming in down here. If we switch this in Navigraph to the VFR chart, we should see an airport diagram, I think. or not. It's not going to do it for us, is it, today? That's interesting. We 
Anyway, we can see this in this nav map. This is why we have redundancy of systems. If we, if we um, zoom in, so we're going to taxi down to the end, turn onto runway six right, uh, runway six, and then we'll get ready to take off. So flaps need to go to take off position, which I've just done on my controller, which is the same as moving this flap lever here. We need to arm the speed brakes. And then come off the parking brake and we can begin taxiing. So we're going to use the rudders, or the tiller I should say. I've not got a tiller configured independently of the rudders, so you're going to see both move at the same time. So I can't think we'll need all of the runway. So we're going to go do what's called an intersection takeoff and go on the shortened version of the runway. In the Airbus you get a small amount of positive thrust from the engines at idle. So once the aircraft's actually rolling, with the engines at idle, it will continue rolling. So you almost have to feather the brakes to slow yourself down from time to time. It's just something to be aware of. So go and line up. Obviously if we had ATC we would have to be stopping at the holding point for the runway requesting you know, permission to enter the runway and all the rest of it. Or well, they would guide us on, not actually request permission. Okay. Final checks. We've done the ground spoilers, we've done the nose wheel steering. That's a good point actually. I think the nose wheel steering is automatically armed in this thing. That's a really good question. So release the parking brake, which is released, and we can go for it. So throttles all the way forwards, which is toga or we'll takeoff go around. Waiting for the rotate speed. Then rotate. Gear up. Throttles back to the CL detent. Autopilot on. And we're done. <laughs> Let's brighten this up a bit on the display. I forgot to brighten that one up earlier. So when I said throttles to the CL detent, what I meant was I have moved both throttles to this marker. Because I've got the Thrustmaster Quadrant, it makes it very easy for me to do that. I can feel it. When they were pushed all the way forwards, it was at Toga, which is take off, go around. Now, in the real world, when you've got two pilots and they're not talking about an audience to this, about this, and one can be doing one thing and one another, they would fly this by hand, typically. And only once they're kind of stable and have dealt with everything would they even dream of... Um, switching on the autopilot whereas we did it at the earliest possible convenience now look notice it sometimes gets things wrong it's recalculating as it goes so we're coming up to the 5,000 feet which is our initial clearance and we are going to go and pull this knob to go to standard barometric pressure now and we're going to climb now to 10,000 feet so I'm going to push the knob in for 10,000 feet, which means you do it the way you think to the aeroplane, yeah? So the aeroplane is now doing it, it's climbing. And notice it's just over speeding. That's because I've still got the flaps down, so that's like I said, I was going to make mistakes. So I've removed the flaps, and now we're above 5,000 feet. It's going for 250 knots should slow down again. It's going to convert speed into climb rate, but it's doing it really badly. It's gone 10 knots faster than it should have. That's interesting. So this is almost certainly a failing of the fly-by-wire aircraft, 
because we've bro just broken aviation law with it on automatic. So it's coming up for 10,000 feet. The reason we're staying at 250 knots is the, the law says you can't exceed 250 knots below 10,000 feet in a commercial aircraft. The other thing we haven't done actually, typical commercial aircraft operations, you would have the landing lights on below 10,000 feet. So these can be switched back off. So just coming up to 10,000 feet, so we would go and switch these off. And then we would climb to our climb altitude. Obviously there would be communication with air traffic control about doing this. And we would increase speed. So you'll see the speed marker climb. Look, it suddenly jumped as soon as we got above 10,000 feet. So the target airspeed jumped from 250 knots to 290 knots. But it's also trying to climb at the same time. Usually the aircraft will favour reaching the target airspeed before it gets to the... before it worries about climbing. It's interesting, look, we, um, because we did such a fast acceleration through those first, those first turns, we've actually gone wide of the flight path, which is why you see the crews flying the plan by hand. If it's a very squirrely standard instrument departure, a human can do it far more, or can react far more quickly than an autopilot can. And you may intentionally, looking at the plan, keep your speed down. We've just gone, you know, like a dragster off down our flight plan. And if you remember, we set a, um, a cost index. So that's going to be factoring that in on the speeds it's going to try and go. If we go and pull this knob for speed instead of pushing it, we can make the decision. We can say, let's go 320 knots. Let's go and light the sky up, basically. So we've told the aircraft we want to do 320, not... Uh, not 280, so yeah. We're, we're forcing the aircraft to do what we want rather than it wants. We'll stay a healthy distance away from the airframe limit though which is the red striped bar on the ribbon okay so now we're climbed out basically we can go and turn the seat belt sign off be nice to have some lights wouldn't it I think sometimes the simulator when it's really bright outside makes it look very dark if you haven't got the control panels in the center shame really. So if we can have a quick look at that. Uh, control 8. Think of us this. I'm just having a quick look to see. I can't remember where the, the light switches are. Here we go. Dome lights. So if we just turn the dome lighting on. It just makes it a little bit brighter to look at. Okay, we haven't actually looked outside, have we, since we took off? There's our A320 en route, following its flight plan. So we're just coming up to Bamsu. If we have a look on the little nav map, we can see how that is representing it. So we're coming up to 20,000 feet. We are well ahead. Notice I said we came out off the ground like a dragster, and look, we're well ahead of the climb profile. Or the one that we, little now would have been wrong, to be honest. It's people kind of tend to try and stick to it, and it's usually wrong. So we're coming up to Bamsu. Turn that back off now. 
and we'll start worrying about descent. You can see if we did a really gradual descent, you're not going to worry about it until you get to past Unoku. So coming up to 25,000 feet gently, you can see it's starting to wind off the climb rate gently, or it will do very soon. Going into some mist, we need to be aware of icing, let's see if we get any warnings about that. Because it's minus 17 outside. See if we've got any signs of ice showing up. No, you can be too cold for ice, and it depends on the um, the amount of moisture in the air. That's if you get icing happen. So we are at 25,000 feet. There we go. Look, the vertical speed is winding off. So the aircraft is leveling out. And it's looking good. Okay, so we've got a couple of minutes. Let's go and extend the range on the... There's the Unoku um, waypoint. So shortly after that we'll begin descending back down again. So we'll first of all come oh, down to... We'll just reach a cruising altitude for the flight as it begins to settle in. I do want to remind you to please keep your feet elbows clear from the aisle as the flight attendants will be coming through the cabin and the galley. We, I think they've removed also the buttons for this. Also, please refrain from congregating with the front galley when the flight deck door is located. Thank you. Might be able to walk through it. No. Have they still got the interior of the cabin modelled? Yeah, I, th I thought they still had this model, but maybe not. We can easily find out by if we press the insert key to go to the drone camera and go and put the drone camera inside the body. No, it's not modelled. Which is why they don't let you go through the door. Oh, that's another aircraft look. So, in about 25 miles time, we will pass Unoku and then we'll start thinking about our descent. So if we increase the range again, we'll get to see... It can't make the turns at the speed we're doing, so this is all based on the speed we're doing right now. But we are going to be slowing right down before we get there, so I wouldn't worry too much. So typically mid-flight, you'll just be checking in and out with sector controllers as you pass through the various sectors along your flight plan. Obviously on a very short one like this you may not even leave the sector. Um, depends what your ATC sector coverage looks like. So I'm just going to have a quick look around. Pilot on TCAS TARA flaps to up. Did I switch to TCAS to TARA? I'm not sure I did. We didn't set. No, I didn't. So, difference between TA and TARA in TA mode, TCAS. TCAS is the Traffic Collision Avoidance System. In TA mode, you will be informed about other aircraft and you're telling other aircraft where you are. In TARA mode, the autopilot will respond to other aircraft. Yeah, so it may well descend or climb to avoid other aircraft. I'm not going to get into the rules of how it does that today. It gets complicated. But typically, if you're in um, depart early stages of departure or in a l later stages of approach, you switch to TA mode instead of TARA. So you are transmitting where you are to other people and taking no notice of where they are. So otherwise you might get an, un an unwanted intervention. 
because obviously the pilots or the crew will be looking out the windows looking for other aircraft ATC will be looking for other aircraft Okay, so we're looking pretty good so far. Just to give us something to do along the way, let's go and descend down to 18,000 feet. So if you are using managed mode to descend, I'm going to use both modes during our flight plan. If you use managed mode, you can just set your target altitude and then push the knob in. The dot will appear and the aircraft will get to 18,000 feet as it sees fit so you can see the N1 percentage is dropping on the engines so it's reducing thrust to allow it to descend without the airspeed increasing So once we get to 18,000 feet we'll go into more of a manual descent mode and I'll explain some bits to you and the reason I'm doing that is I want to show you some of the symbology you get when you use vertical speed. So you can see this is getting it wrong in the rendering at the moment. If you've got the Phoenix Airbus it won't get it wrong, not in the same way that this one does. I'm using the stable version of the fly-by-wire A320. The um, the development version tends to have better rendering. I'm quite shocked actually that that's got that so badly wrong. But we'll see once I slow down. Traffic, traffic. There we go. That's T A R A, the um, traffic collision avoidance system. You can see it there. Look. Maintain vertical speed. Maintain clear of conflict. Maintain vertical speed. I'm just looking to see if we can see it. Where was it? I think it may have been something directly below us. Anyway, I'm not going to worry. You can see the marker there, look. It could have been above us, I guess. If they're there, they haven't got their lights on. Normally you can see the lights. Okay, so we are going to slow down to 250 knots and in, in anticipation of dropping down to 10,000 feet in a few minutes' time. We're also going to go for 10,000 feet and go for managed... Actually, let's do this on a managed descent of, say, 15 or 2,000 feet a minute. Let's see if it'll do it. So notice, I've set 2,000 feet a minute. We can go, by using a vertical speed, we can go beyond what the aircraft can manage to do. So it might start even start accelerating, even though the auto throttle says a given speed. So we might have to start using the air brakes. So I'm going to throw the air brakes out. So the aircraft will decelerate now. You can see that happening on the indicated airspeed ribbon. If we go and look outside, you can see I've thrown out the air brakes, so the flaps along the back of the wings have lifted. And the engines are at idle. When it 
if we go and switch this back to managed mode you can see now the speed has come down the radius of these turns has shortened enormously so we actually want to fly out to RID that's what the flight plan said but the, um, the computer is going to round the corner off so it's going to come over here and then I'm almost immediately loop back in and come round now we know at the start of the ILS we need to be at a given height so let's have a quick look at the chart while all that's happening so we want to be at 4000 feet at RID if we're coming in from that direction if we put this over the top of the chart we come down here and we want to be at 4000 feet yeah let's have another look at this one so it's interesting that it hasn't got the restrictions written on it in blue. Normally they have restrictions written on them in blue. So something that will be worth looking at in Little Nav Map is how high above the ground Frankfurt is. So if we show information for Frankfurt, we've got elevation 364 feet. So it wants us above 4,000 feet at Robsa. So we're coming down, we're at 11,000 foot at the moment. Let's go and reduce the range on this so we get a better drawing of it. So we are going to be reducing speed as we go anyway. So we're also going to tell everybody to go and sit down. So seatbelt signs go back on going to be below 10,000 feet soon yes just coming up so we are going to go and turn on the landing lights So we're at 10,000 feet now, so we could easily drop another 220, go come down to 220 maybe. I'm just thinking about making those turns a lot easier for ourselves, or sharper turns. It's making the turn, we're going to come down for 4,000 feet now, and go for it. Remember at 6,000 feet, well, let's just check that on the charts. For the problem with finding this is they print the um, transition altitude in a different place on every chart. So we probably want 5,000 feet for the... it's probably still 5,000 isn't it for the transition altitude. I'm just looking to see where they've written it. It's always in a different place and it's really frustrating. Transition level by ATC transition altitude 5,000 feet so if you saw my video about what transition level and altitude mean transition level is the first flight level available above the transition altitude so that's where you go so 5,000 feet is where we switch back to the QNH of the destination so we can find that out if we go and look in here and go right click on Frankfurt actually we already had it didn't we in the cockpit QNH is 1028 at Frankfurt. <coughs> so we are just coming down. So when we get to 5,000 feet, I'm going to do this a little bit ahead of time just so you get to see it. So we push this to go back to normal. And <laughs> this, is, this has got the alternate system for the QNH. This has got inches rather than... Can we easily change it in the Airbus? Yes, there's a knob here, look. There we go. We want 1028. So we've changed this to hectopascals, which are used in Europe. Inches tend to be used in the US. Okay, so we'll come off the air brakes now. 
So you can see now we have slowed down, we can make these turns a lot more easily. So we're going to slow down again and coast back to 180 knots. And we'll start to feed the flaps in. So we go flaps one. Obviously they provide drag in and of themselves, which will help us. quite interesting obviously because we're getting this foggy mist so there's the Frankfurt itself we're going to pass by the airfield on our right I think the river is completely frozen up according to this we're not going to get to see much are we that actually plays into our hands to do like an instrument landing, I guess. So let's go and double check. We're coming in on 7 right. So 11095 would be the ILS frequency. So we're going to double check that in the um, MCDU. So the radio navigation button, 11095 is pre-programmed in because it was part of our flight plan. It also knows the course of the runway 66 degrees. So it's already all done for us. So all that means is when we get, um, when we make our final turn towards the airport, we will turn one of the EFIS screens to LS or landing system mode. And then the symbology will change to show us the ILS. So we're down to 180 knots. We can go for flap two, which will just change the attitude of the aircraft slightly. The, no the nose will come down. What's the outside air temperature looking like? Minus three. I'm not very happy about the um, any ice forming. So I'm gonna go and turn the various protections on. to protect the aircraft so if we look left we should see Frankfurt Airport so we will be looping around to the right in a moment and coming back in on that runway and there's Frankfurt the city me zoom in far enough it probably won't render it very well from here so there's the river running through the city <coughs> quite dramatic weather In the real world, you'd be communicating with air traffic control, talking to approach on the way in, and they might be regulating your speed to avoid other traffic, to, you know, to improve sequencing. They may even give you vectors away from your flight plan. <coughs> Dear me. So if we go back and look at the flight plan page, we can see if there are any restrictions along our way. It's all looking good. So once we do the double back at RID, I will drop the undercarriage. Actually, we could do that after the final turn towards approach. It's just a waiting game now, really. As I said, in the real aircraft, this may well be all be flown manually but then they've got two pilots, they're not talking, they're not doing all this stuff. Once I get through this final turn, I may well do it manually myself. I can, I'll show you how you can use the ILS, but then I will revert to manual control for the actual descent and landing. I'll turn the auto throttle and the autopilot off and do a manual landing. Okay, 
so the plane should start turning very soon so let's pull the zoom level down one more step side as it makes it happen. And there we go. Okay, so knowing we have the display on the other side of the cockpit, we'll replicate the range this is at, and let's have a quick look at it, see what this landing display looks like. So you can see the glide slope is coming, actually. But we are going to fly back away from the airfield, and then turn back in. So this is the direction of the runway. We're going opposite, you know, the opposite of the runway direction at the moment then we're going to backtrack across so if we look at this on a map to show you where we are and what's going on we're going towards Robsa now and then we'll turn in for the final approach it'd be interesting I suspect we may be above the glide slope at the time we come away from Robsa but we'll find out Excuse my coughing, I've not been very well at all for the last week. So you can see, if you think about where the tangent is to the airfield on the diagram over here, and where the vertical speed is, uh, sorry, the, uh, where the localizer, not, oh, listen to me, the glide slope. Um, it should start climbing again, so I think we should be fine. Because all this is really relating is how far away we are on the three degree glide slope towards the runway. So it should start climbing again as we get further away from the airfield now. So let's see if that is proven true. Let's see if this gently starts to move back up the gauge. lots of other aircraft around so we need to remember to switch the um, TCAS to TA mode otherwise we will be reacting to them and we don't really care about them for this demonstration flight still at 4,000 feet yeah this is gently raising look so we're getting further away so the glide slope is climbing that's good because we need to be below the glide slope at the point we go for approach mode if we're going to do it. So the approach mode button is over here. So we'll wait till we come around that final turn. We're just approaching it now. So you can see over on the secondary, on the co-pilot screen, we're about to make the turn. So let's start scrubbing some more speed off. 160 knots. Go for an extra level of flaps. Aircraft should start turning any moment now. Oh, 
Now there was the nose wheel steering switch by the way, it was on by default which is why I was a bit flummoxed as to why it was on the list because as I said earlier I haven't got anything in the checklist that isn't needed based on the, the default configuration of the simulator. So we're just coming in towards approach. So you can see that happening over on the second screen over there. If we go and look on the map, on this one nav map, you can see that happening. Coming towards the approach. So you will see we're coming into the runway direction. The course deviation indicator is sliding in. So at this point we will go and drop the undercarriage. Already got the landing lights on, which is good. And we could go to approach mode now, and we could also turn on both autopilots. Yeah, and that will say Cat 3 Jewel now. Yeah, and autopilots 1 and 2 are in operation. So we can now start playing with slowing down. 140 knots. Go to full flaps. So with the approach mode on, the aircraft will track the um, the glide slope, and we well, can see it's already levelling out to centre up the localizer. The, our, our, lateral position relative to the runways which are out in the mist ahead of us so you will see yeah it started descending look so it's tracking the glide slope down towards the ground now completely automatically so so that's how we could do it and we could leave it like that i'm going to go and turn all of that off and fly it in myself because what's the fun in that so, autopilot off, auto throttle off. I'm just uh, moving the throttles to find out where the, the level is. Okay. So now we're just going to watch these gauges to steer. We've got full flaps. There's the runway directly ahead of us. So we just need to be mindful of speed and our vertical position in the sky and our lateral position relative to the runway ahead of us. And we should be good. When we touch down, we will go for thrust reverses until we get to about 70 or 80 knots, then we'll go for wheel brakes. Quite often you'll see the, um, the flight crews go for spoilers as well. So they basically throw everything out to use aerodynamic braking. It saves the, the wheel brakes and short, obviously it shortens the, the landing roll. So we're slightly off to the right. You can see that reflected here. So we're just rolling left a little and bringing it back. So you can see the reason for that is there is a slight crosswind. Actually, quite a strong crosswind. There's 27 knot wind at 36 degrees. Or from 36 degrees. So there's a very strong wind with a horizontal component in it that's pushing us to the right. We're getting a bit slow. Keeping an eye on these various instruments, so dropping the nose a little. Still being pushed to the right, so we're going to aim a little bit more to the left. It's just a balancing game really. I think the frame, mate, frame rate might be quite horrendous coming in from this direction in this weather. 
but um, we're not going to worry too much about that. Traffic, traffic. And that was why we turned the TCAS to TA mode, otherwise it may well have reacted to that. So we're traffic, going to reduce traffic. this down to 10 miles an hour. We can see the markers around us on the, the chart there. Those are other aircraft. Traffic, traffic. So those will be multiplayer aircraft almost certainly. They may be AI aircraft as well. There's one directly below us or uh, above traffic, us. You'll traffic. probably see it in a moment. 1,000. Traffic, traffic. Traffic, traffic. We could probably go and turn off the anti-icing now. Traffic, traffic. Again, this is where, in the real world, having two pairs of hands to do things is invaluable. We're a bit high, so we're just going to lower traffic, the nose. Traffic. So by saying I'm a bit high, I was just referring to this gauge here for the um, the glide slope. 500. The wind has tailed off a lot as we got lower, so we're down to nine knots, but it's also swung round to the north. Three hundred. So we were getting a bit slow there. The, st the stuttering is really bad. One hundred. Fifty. Forty. Thirty. Twenty. Retard. Ten. Five. And we're down. So reverses. The rudder doesn't seem to be doing a lot, but that's by configuration more than anything, probably. So I'll let the, let the nose fall, and we can go for wheel brakes, and chuck out the spoilers as well, and look how quickly it stops. So, flaps are going up, we get off the runway, and we can taxi back. So terminals are over here. We're going to completely disregard any runway uh, permissions and make our way directly back without passing go. It's quite interesting looking at Frankfurt because I've been here so many times over the years with work. Um, it seems very familiar seeing the Lufthansa service buildings. Okay, so now we are on the ground, obviously, we turn off the landing lights. We also need to turn off the strobes, but again, this is the having two pairs of hands becomes really useful. <laughs> Most of the time coming into Frankfurt, you, oops, you won't go to a gate. Um, they tend to park out on the tarmac and they have lots and lots of buses. But we'll go and have a look. Yeah, it's really nailing the frame rate, isn't it, with the weather conditions and the complexity of Frankfurt.
So on the way back, typically you will also find that the um, the crew will switch back on and start the APU, ready for when we get back to the gate or wherever we're parking, so we can turn the engines off and not lose electrical power if we don't have external power available at the place we're going. It's like a star shape, the, the terminals here at Frankfurt. I think this is the one, the, the typical European um, hub. I can't remember. I can't remember the terminal numbers or letters. It's been a while. find an empty gate somewhere just to go and put the aircraft in yeah we'll go over here not entirely sure which which one that is but we'll soon find it oh this will do directly in front of us So each of these um, hubs on the, the um, at Frankfurt tends to have a cafe in this circular kind of rotunda bit on the end of each arm, and then the the gates come off of that rotunda. Okay, so let's go. Parking brakes on. So that obviously you would then call for engine shutdown. The trick here being that we've also already got the APU running, so we've got electrical power, so if we need to, we can just shut the engines down and nothing bad is going to happen. So we can go and turn that beacon light off, nav lights off, and go and turn the seatbelt sign off. The passengers all go bananas behind us. Uh, no smoking sign, we can go to back off now. We can turn off the emergency exit lights. I'm not doing this in the correct order now, by the way. Uh, we can go and turn off those uh, fuel pumps. So you can see that various warnings are coming up across the board. Uh, if we press Control 8, we can see that a lot better, actually. We can go and turn off the inertial navigation system. And there's not really a lot to do with powering things down on an Airbus. It's pretty much, you know, most of it. You're really, it's mostly around putting things back the way they wish to be found. Uh, because it's a digital system, a lot of the buttons don't have an in or a pushed or a not pushed status either. So um yeah it's it's interesting so go and turn off the tcas obviously when you get closer to being shut down completely you would just go and turn off the apu and then your final check is the battery itself and you go completely cold and dark and there you go so it's a bit noisy outside isn't it with all these jets moving around there you go, a nice flight in the fly-by-wire A320. Obviously we haven't looked at things like calling for the jetway or anything like that, we're just operating the aeroplane, but hopefully that satisfies the people that were asking, can you do a complete flight from end to end in a, a familiar aeroplane? So I've done it now, so that's that monkey off my back for you. As I said, I typically fly these kind of things with ATC control in the week. If you're interested in doing that, there's a group I fly with regularly called My Air. If you search for them on the internet, you'll find them. Um, they're a very relaxed group of guys that a couple of them nominate themselves as ATCs each week. 
and provide a route and probably get eight or ten of us flying it and do the ATC communication between us. It's a lot more informal and more relaxed than the likes of VATSIM where it's a lot more, you know, by the book. But it's a really nice stepping stone to VATSIM. Anyway, let's call it a day there and I'll see you again soon.